All yours. Okay, everybody, welcome to the fourth lecture in the Excelsior series, the Excelsior lecture series, given today by the man who does these lectures, who organizes it for all of us, uh, Dr. Michael Poon. We all know Dr. Poon, a valuable asset to Excelsior. Almost, you could say he was acquired from the Yankees. So Dr. Poon has a long, illustrious history. Uh, goes back many years. His T is longer than any object you guys have ever seen. More studies, articles, committees, professorships than the entire Excelsior and anybody else I know. Um, I know Dr. Poon since 1993. And a very interesting story. He is actually the original metaverse creator. And what this means, and he's wondering, he's looking at me. What that means is I was an intern at Mount Sinai and I go to the emergency room and I see Dr. Poon. Okay, nice guy. He's moonlighting in the ER seeing patients. All right, I admit the patient. I go up to the floor. There's Dr. Poon again. This time, same night, an hour later, he's covering for the 10 top cardiologists on the Upper East Side. These top cardiologists, everybody pays cash to go to, actually never really saw their patients. Michael Poon saw them all in Mount Sinai. He did all the work, but that's not all. Then we go to the CCU. He's covering the CCU that night too. Very strange, you'd think there's only one guy walking around Mount Sinai. And it doesn't end there. You go back to the ER and this is a sight you never saw. Michael Poon standing between two patients, holding two echo machines, doing two echoes simultaneously on the patient. And that's what we're talking about, the multiverse. In many places at once, doing multitasking like you've never seen, and at the same time managing to publish a plethora of articles and an amazing guy, an amazing physician. And we're gonna hear now how not to die at 37. And hopefully afterwards also. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan. You got it. Okay. Um, really, my pleasure to uh, to speak tonight as a speaker, and uh, and this is a very important topic to me and to everybody here. Um, heart attack is still the number one cause of death in the United States, and you may wonder why did I pick the age thirty seven? Well, it just happened. I saw a patient a few weeks ago, a young lady who is age thirty seven. So. I just decided to use her as a, as a case in point. And if you look at this slide, um, as much as we put a lot of hype behind COVID-19, heart disease is still by far kill more American per year than any other diseases. Uh, the lady that I use as an example, which is the title of this talk, who came to see me after several days of severe substernal chest pain. She went to a local hospital emergency room in Flushing, Queens, and had an EKG and some routine blood work done. She was watched and discharged without any treatment. And she was given a diagnosis of anxiety, which is quite common when you're young and you're female, you go to the emergency room, it's very likely that you're gonna get that diagnosis and nothing was done. So the next day she continued to have similar unrelenting chest pain. So she went to a local urgent care this time. And again, an EKG was done and she was told that everything's fine. And she was referred to see me in our flushing office. So she left the urgent care and came to see me immediately. As you all know, chest pain is a very common symptom and scary. And because you worry about, it could be a heart attack. And heart attack signs, the number one symptom is chest pain, but it can masquerade with all other symptomatology that we are very familiar with like nausea, indigestion, upper back pain, sweating, vomiting, stomach pain, anything from the chin to the belly button could be angina. So it's very, very difficult for any diagnostician to say that this is 
a heart attack, but this is not a heart attack. Well, when I saw the, this lady, I did an EKG just like the urgent care and the emergency room and the EKG shown on the left, not quite remarkable. And we did an echo and the wall motion looks pretty good. And so based on the EKG, the echo, there's really nothing that I would say that definitely is pointing to a heart attack. So what, what, what should we do next? Well, that, uh, that's a tough question. And the key question is, what should we do that could definitively uh, the possibility of a heart attack? And right now, in most cardiology practice, the most common tests we have are stress testing, nuclear MPI, or stress echo. And but we have to know a little bit more about the pathogenesis, the cause of heart attack. And one of the very common myths uh, for heart disease is that it is a stable progression of some kind of atherosclerotic plaque over time, eventually leading to chest pain. And most likely as you get older, you get heart disease. And as shown in this cartoon figure here. So every 10 years of your life, you get some plaque buildup. And eventually when you get to 50 and 60, the plaque buildup lead to some kind of rupture and then you get heart attack. That was the common myth. Because if that's true, then this 37 year old lady probably had nothing, right? It will be somewhere in between 30 and 40 and there's no, no way there's enough plaque to cause a heart attack. This is an angiogram showing narrowing of the coronary vessel in patients with severe coronary disease. The problem with the conventional testing is that for most individuals, you are not going to be able to find any positive finding, no matter which functional testing you choose, whether it's stress EKG, stress echo, stress MPI, because this graph show you that until you have a narrowing close to 80%, you are not gonna have a positive stress testing. I don't care whether you add imaging or not because the coronary flow reserve is so good that until you have an obstruction that is more than 80%, most of the convention, conventional functional testing would be negative. And you would be left with a sense of security that, oh, stress test negative, so you probably have nothing to worry about. So until the narrowing is more than 80%, you would start to have some abnormality on the functional testing. So for this woman, you have two choices. Either do what we do a lot in our office, a stress treadmill test. And now at Excelsior, we have uh, an atomical test that's sort of a new kit in the block. And, and I will try to convince you during the remaining of this talk that this is probably and is supported by very strong clinical evidence be the right test to do. Well, I did a CTA on this uh, 37 year old lady and she had a subtotal occlusion of a proximal LAD. And this is a CT angio uh, done at 94 Bowery. And you can see that no contrast going down. And this is what we call widowmaker lesion. That means if this occludes, you die. And it doesn't matter your man or woman, widow, widow or maker, it doesn't matter. And it'll kill you. <laughs> so it's really surprising to me. And you may say, well, is 37 the youngest? No, I have seen 24 year old came to the emergency room. 
with chest pain. And everybody was laughing at him. What are you doing here on a Saturday morning? You know, and uh, that patient, after I performed a CCTA, turned out to have the same widowmaker lesion. So it's not, the age is really not that important. You have to know that the, the cause of the total occlusion is not a linear process. It didn't progress over time. Something happened causing the lesion to become unstable. So if you look at this graph, if I perform stress tests on this lady, it probably would be very dangerous because she has a subtotal occlusion. Just imagine you put this lady on the treadmill having chest pain and you're trying to provoke it, it could be disaster. So going back to the questions, why such a young lady would have such a disastrous scenario? Well, if you look at the timeline of coronary atherosclerosis, yes, it's true that it takes many years for the plaque to build up, but you don't need to go to 80, 90% to develop unstable symptoms. In fact, most of the plaque occur when the plaque is only 40 to 50% stenotic. And this is really surprising, right? So you think that you are invincible and your coronary probably nothing serious and you're young, but suddenly you have a heart attack and you're gonna say, why me? Well, that is the million dollar question. We don't know why it happened, but we do know that it happened. And when it happened, the consequence is obviously disastrous. So when the plaque rupture as shown here, you basically tear open your blood vessel and the clot form, and that's give rise to the tombstone EKG, and the total occlusion on the angiography as shown on the right. But this is the very last stage and you don't want this to happen in your office. So, in 2003, I started working on a new imaging technique at that time, coronary CTA. And when I first looked at it, and I said, wow, this is gonna be revolutionary because for the first time, you can look at the entire coronary tree non-invasively, and you can see the presence of plaque in the blood vessel. And we know that it's very important. There's no other imaging technique can do this. Even when you do uh, invasive angiography, you probably won't see small plaque like this because invasive angiography only allow you to see what the contrast allow you to see. CTA show more than the contrast, it show the vessel wall. That's why it is such a powerful imaging technique. So I've been that one day there will be a paradigm shift that we will change from functional to anatomical testing. That was 2003. It took almost 20 years for this paradigm to shift from functional stress testing, doesn't matter, stress echo, stress nuclear, MPI, EKG, to anatomical testing using CCTA. In 2012, the chest pain guideline only gave stress ECG and stress MPI class 1A, in 1B indication, not 1A. Nothing is 1A at that time because just not enough data, randomized control study to support the, 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 the 1A classification. And at that time, CCTA, was only 2B. That's why nobody was thinking of using CCTA for years, even though the data was accumulating over time. The challenge is status quo is not easy. It's like, you know, everybody thinking of MPI, stress echo, stress ECG. To try to do without functional testing is hard. 
you need really, really good scientific data to change this very, very, you know, ingrained status quo. And it took three New England Journal of Medicine article to change the guideline finally from an atom anatomical base, from functional base to anatomical base. The first paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the group at Duke University asked a very tough question. They looked at the, the database, NCDR, which is the database that collects all the cath data around the country. And they found that most of the cath are really are not, not necessary. 62.4% of diagnostic cath turn out to have no, no problem. You shouldn't have done it. So why? Because at that time, for the longest time, the gatekeeper is either MPI or stress ECG or stress echo. And stress MPI was really the major gatekeeper leading to cath for many, many years prior to 2010. So they said, maybe there's something wrong with this gatekeeper. It's sending a lot of false positive to the cath lab and there's nothing to do and wasted a lot of money. In fact, the uh, Truven data recently showing similar data that if you start a patient with a stress MPI or stress PAT, you're gonna lead to a lot more cath than CCTA. So this is the question. Should we change the gatekeeper from a functional testing to an anatomical testing like CCTA? Well, in order to prove that, you need some really uh, good, well-done randomized control study. So the key question is, how could imaging save you from dying of a heart attack? Is it because it detects severe disease at the right moment before the heart attack? Well, this study published a few years ago now uh, by a group of investigators in England, United Kingdom, uh, called the Scott Hart. It's a five-year study. They look at four, they randomized 4,146 patients across the United Kingdom to between CCTA or the standard of care, which is ECG, stress ECG, stress MPI or stress echo. And what they found is that CCTA drastically reduced the death rate from MI compared to the standard of care in five years. If you look at the curve, the separation is dramatic. And when you look at the revascularization rate, that there are actually fewer revascularization of PCI in the CCTA group. It did not lead to more invasive procedure. So the question that the imaging stopped you from having heart attack is not true. It didn't stop you at the moment of the heart attack. There's something else that the, a good imaging, like an anatomical imaging like CCTA, does that will save you from dying of a heart attack. And the investigator concluded that it was because CCTA improves patient compliance, resulting in better clinical outcomes. And that was very, very mind opening. Because if you think about the patient that we see every day, how many of do what you told them to do. A lot of patients say, oh, yeah, uh, Dr. So-and-so wrote this statin, but I don't take it. You know, I, I don't know if it is really good for me and it may hurt my liver and so on and so forth. So a lot of patients are really non-compliant and that's the problem. So CCTA is the only imaging test from this study that able to improve the patient compliance. And I personally have experience of the same. Let me show you this CTA on the right. You see all these plaques. I'll show it to my patient. You see, look at this. If you don't do something to reduce the plaque, you're gonna have a heart attack. 
you know what? That patient immediately from that day on stick to the regimen. They take the statin, they take the aspirin, they take the Vizepa, what have you. But they're just afraid of dying of a heart attack. Because this is the only image that I need to show. And it, can, it could change the behavior. So that is very important. As a doctor, we know that if we can get the compliance improves, it will improve the outcome subsequently. Because of that Scott Heart trial, which is a randomized control study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the guideline in the United Kingdom was changed to CCTA first in 2016. They said, forget it. We don't want any more functional testing. Patients should have CCTA first. And if that's inconclusive, then you do functional testing. That was a very bold move. And just based on one very well done study in UK. And a couple of years later, the European guideline basically follow the Scott Hart recommendation, but it sort of hatched the bed a little bit. It didn't put CCTA first. It sort of put CCTA and functional testing like MPI at the equal footing. They're both class 1B. So we need one more well done randomized control study to put CCTA ahead. So we were waiting and waiting and 2019 was the paradigm shift moment for non-invasive cardiac imaging. A study called Ischemia, which, which was funded by NIH, it took 10 years, $100 million. Okay. The study was not designed to compare CCTA with stress testing. It was designed to ask the question, is conservative strategy of treating stable coronary disease as good as invasive approach? But in there, they include CCTA as a gatekeeper. And very interestingly, these patients all have very abnormal nuclear stress tests. And when they perform CCTA, they found that there's a lot of forced positive stress testing, 14%. So these patients basically have no disease, but nuclear say moderate to severe ischemia. And they say on CTA, there's no disease. So these patients cannot be randomized. And they also found a lot of patients with widowmaker lesion, left main, that was missed by the stress testing. And these patients were excluded. So had they not done CCTA, they would have randomized some patient that would be too high risk for the study. And they would also include a lot of patients who shouldn't be part of the study because there's no disease. So this is very, very powerful study to show that we need to change the gatekeeper to avoid both the force positive and the force negative. This is sort of the study. They, they enroll all the patients from after stress testing and they use CCTA to find out who should be in the study. And then they randomize the patient to conservative versus invasive approach. Conservatives is basically just take your medication. I'm not going to do stent. I'm not going to do bypass. I'm going to use medication for as long as possible versus the other group that goes straight to the cath lab to have the stent put in or the bypass surgery. And this is the outcome of the 10 years, $100 million NIH funded study, ischemia trial. Basically, there's no difference between conservative versus invasive approach. The mortality, there's no mortality difference, okay? There is some benefit for those patients with symptoms to go through the invasive arm. Other than that, there's to improve the symptoms, there's no mortality benefit. That's the conclusion of this landmark study. So, Basically, this study showed that you can treat patients with good 
optimal medical therapy. You don't necessarily have to go the invasive route from the, from the gecko. And you will see no difference in the uh, mortality between the two groups. And the corollary of the ischemia trial is that perhaps we should change the gatekeeper. Instead of the stress testing to avoid both forced positive and forced negative results. So this is the new journal medicine article that puts CCTA over the top. And in 2021, which is last year, the new chest pain guideline separate CCTA from functional stress testing. So now the only imaging test that has class 1A indication is CCTA. And this is sort of finally, <laughs> after 20 years, you know, enough you know, waiting and teaching of all the people without the randomized control study, the guideline would never be changed. So I'm very happy that the, that the guideline committee finally listened and, 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 and believed in the randomized control study. So in summary, the detection of atherosclerotic plaque is more important than detection of stenosis. And this is from the Scott Hart trial. Because when you see the plaque, you're gonna treat the patient more aggressively and you're gonna convince the patient to be compliant on the medical therapy. That's gonna save lives. And right now, both the calcium score scan and the CCTA can detect coronary plaque. Ooh, an atomical evaluation of coronary arteries now has one A indication, and not only for stable, but also for acute chest pain. And functional testing, don't get me wrong, continue to be very important, but there are a lot of conditions you need to figure out. I just I don't know how many stress echo today, because I have to figure out what's the cause of the dyspnea shortness of breath or arrhythmia, I need to reproduce the phenomenon on the treadmill or pulmonary hypertension. So I need a functional testing to help me to take care of that group of patients. Or conservative management of obstructive coronary artery disease with optimal medical therapy is safe. And that's the conclusion from the ischemia trial. And invasive intervention, PCI or cabbage for symptomatic relief of chest pain or dyspnea is not for the mortality benefit. It's basically only for the symptom, symptomatic relief. So if the patient has no symptom, you don't need to do anything invasive. That's the take home message from the ischemia trial. So why do I prefer CCTA first? Well, not only that I invested a lot of my time over the last 20 years on the technology, but also it really, as a clini clinician, I find it very, very useful. Imagine that young lady, 36, 37, came in with a Widowmaker lesion. You know, stress testing on that lady could be very dangerous, right? And it's not unheard of that people die on the treadmill or shortly after the stress test. Just imagine 37 year old drop dead in the office. That's, that's no good. And the other thing is high force negative for detecting left main and widow make a lesion is worrisome. That's the problem with a lot of the functional testing. They are just not that good in picking up these very dangerous condition. And the ischemia trial show you that, right? Had they not done CCTA, would left main would, would have been included in the study. What could help guide the medical therapy? Absolutely. And I, I can attest to that. Many patients, once they look at the CTA, 
they look at the calcium score on the bottom. You can see the left is the calcium score without contrast. You don't need to give contrast. Basically, right now, calcium score is still not covered by most insurance, so you have to pay $100 for the test. But with a, for $100 every five years, is money well spent. And you can take a look whether you have plaque or no plaque. And if you have plaque, you better get your cholesterol level down. You, you better take good care of your uh, uh, diabetes. You got to take good care of your high blood pressure. You have to be physically active, you know, rather than sedentary lifestyle. You got to lose weight, all the things. But you got to have a something to convince the patient that if you don't do something, you may get a heart attack soon and calcium score or CCTA on the right, uh, is perfect to convince the patient and make sure the patient will be compliant from that point on. National insurance data also suggests that CCTA is cost effective. We had a meeting with United Healthcare and the medical director told me point blank, he said, Mike, this is, the comparison between CCTA and nuclear stress test is not even close. We have internal data to show the CCTA by far is a better test and cost effective. It was the first insurance company in the country that put CCTA first about two and a half years ago. Science is key to the success of medical therapy. And able to show what's going on in the coronary artery using either the calcium score or the CCTA improve patient compliance. And that is very important, which is what the Scott Hart showed. So I hope in just uh, the past 32 minutes, I was able to give you uh, an idea why I believe in anatomical testing first, I'm not excluding functional, but as a first test, there's so much evidence to support the use of anatomical testing to save lives and improve compliance. These are all very important as a clinician. So uh, I will end here, and this is my email address for those of you who are too shy to ask questions in front of everybody. And you can email me and I'll, I will, Promise you I'll answer all your questions. Jonathan. Dr. Moon, that was a fascinating, enlightening talk here. And uh, I, I got a bunch of questions. I'll start with one or two, and then group will uh, hopefully follow with some stuff. First question is the 37-year-old woman, what were her characteristics? Anything special about her? Just regular skinny um, girl walking around? She's, um, no, she was... Um, Pretty normal looking to Hispanic, uh, but you know, she doesn't have anything unusual. Her family history was not anything that you would particularly say that, hey, that uh, that's something majorly uh, abnormal, no. And, and actually it's not unusual. The 24 year old that I saw in the past who had a heart attack also, who's a Suffolk County policeman, and they get drug testing all the time, so it's not drugs. And the cholesterol profile was, you know, like any one of us. And he had a major league plaque rupture leading to acute closure of the uh, proximal LAD on a Saturday morning. So, I mean, that's the, that's the problem with coronary artery disease, very unpredictable. You can't look at a patient and say, oh, this, this person has no risk. That person has a lot of risk. I, I just, from my many years of taking care of patients in the emergency room, in the ICU, it just, you know, crap shoot. I mean. Did, did she vape? Just curious. Oh, no, she's okay. medium size. Yeah. Oh, vape. I, mean, I think her BMI may be 29, 28. I mean, it's not greater than 30. <laughs> so oh, like, did you, did well, you vape? Vape. Uh, no, 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 no. Va vaping. You know, not not smoking, vaping. but vaping. No, no, no. There's electronic cigarette. No. 
All right, good. And anybody have any questions? Anybody want to uh, ask anything or you want me to keep going questioning? Steven, you got a question? No. All right, so next question, I'll, I'll... Steven Esposito, are you asking? I see your lips, but I don't hear. You're muted if you want to ask. Dr. Esposito. All right, so let me ask you this. What's the radiation exposure for the CTTA? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the better scanner, uh, the dose will be lower. Um, the one that we have, uh, 64 slice, if you do it prospectively, which is what we are trying to do most of the time, the dose is about five millisievert, which is pretty res you know, respectable. Um, and How does that compare to a mammogram or a chest X-ray? For relative terms, chest X-rays is 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 about uh, a lot more. I mean, what they call it, fifty. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big number. Um, but you know, you don't you don't do it for the fun of doing it, right? And you have chest pain. Uh, nuclear MPI is about twelve millisievert. So you know, you saw. You saw what you get out of it. You know, after 12 millisiever, if you don't get an answer, it's not really, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not worthwhile. So, so I mean, the dose is not off the wall compared to other, you know, common tests that we do to our patient. Um, information is what makes it so valuable. Yeah. Gotcha. And Again, open the floor up to anybody who's brave. All right, so next question I have is um, along the same line. So you're looking for a, uh, anatomical thing. And, and, you know, some patients may be reluctant to get a CAT scan thinking it's like a thousand chest X-rays. Um, insurance companies may give you a hard time. Is there any um, surrogate, like a carotid Doppler or something like that that could give you an idea that you could sort of do the same thing on the cheap. Yeah, I mean, there are some data suggesting carotid, uh, carotid ultrasound or intermolecular yeah. thickening can be used as a surrogate uh, marker for coronary artery disease. Um, I would argue that, you know, coronary is coronary. The coronary vessel is a lot smaller than carotid. And yeah. try it. Excuse me. No, the, so 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 coronary, the diameter of coronary artery is a lot smaller, so it doesn't take much to cause obstruction. So using other vessel, I think you know I've seen patients with nothing on the neck but obstructed in the corner. So you know it it, it you know they are not the same, and it because the rheology is different, the biology is different. So, I mean, for coronary, I would, I, I would argue that either calcium score, if you worry about high radiation dose contrast. So you can just do a calcium score, which is about half to one millisievert, right? Compared to five. So it's a lot less. And if that's all you want to get the information about plaque, you don't need to do CTA. CTA really should be reserved for intermediate risk that you worry that there is obstruction and you really want to see what's going on. Now, calcium score not gonna show you soft plaque. So if soft plaque is what you worry about, especially young patient, then CCTA is the only way to go. Because we have seen patients with zero calcium score and total occlusion. So, so, you know, just because your zero calcium score is not 100% is not bulletproof. So what is the cash price for a CCTA? We have a pretty good deal. Thanks to uh, Grace and Dr. Chen, we only charge $600. Very good. All right. Anybody have any questions? Anybody? 
Oh, oh yes. What's up, Dr. Esposito? Go ahead. A good and bad calcium score. What grade? Um, I know. I know what you just said before, but what's a what does the calcium score go up to? Ten, five, and what's a good score? What's a bad score? Yeah, I mean, to me, the only good score is zero. Anything other than zero, then you have plaque, you know, growing. So uh, I would advise my patient to start, you know, working on risk factor modification. So unless you have zero, then the actually there's some data that you don't even need to take statin. So I take some of the patient with zero calcium score off statin, off aspirin. I say you, you have nothing, so don't, don't worry. Uh, but so other than zero, plaque? I'm sorry? What about the soft plaque? Well that's, well, that's the data from the calcium score literature that if it's right. zero, they, they didn't really ask it. The soft plaque is, is rare, but uh, you know, I, you know, as a doctor, we have to think of the worst, right? We can't always think of the, <laughs> we can't always think that everybody's have, uh, you know, zero calcium score, you know, they have nothing, you know. I, so if you have chest pain, I would still give you contrast to look at whether it's a soft plaque that's causing it, but most of the time, uh, would be negative if it's zero calcium score. So to answer your question, Dr. Esposito, you know, any calcium score other than zero, you should be very vigilant in lowering the coronary artery disease risk. And obviously the higher the score, the more aggressive you have to. Uh, in fact, once the calcium score is over a couple hundred, the chance of regression is practically zero. You know, while the calcium score is still low, if you really lower your LDL to below 70 and, you know, check your uh, blood sugar and, and, you know, lifestyle modification, you have a small chance that it could become better. Reverse plaque? Reverse plaque, yeah. Uh, there's uh, some data that uh, actually you, you can, the plaque reversal at the early stage, not when the calcium is very, very high. Dr. Ho, you have a question? Uh, yes, um, the really good talk, really good uh, research. Um, and then, but um, uh, because in this uh, non-invasive and even um, if a patient had a um, um, in the media or positive um, nuclear test, and then they want to, they don't want to. The, the other cardiology recommend the patient to go to the cat cat lab, and then the patient doesn't want that, and then go to you and for the second opinion. Do would you recommend the CCTA for the patient and then load them out and then? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, some some cardiologists in Chinatown almost do CAT exclusively. And mm. many of the patients come to see me in second opinion. And I can tell you 90% is nothing. <laughs> so, oh. and, and, and they're so happy. You know, just imagine you go to CAT lab after they, you know, stick a needle into your radio artery or your worst to your groin and then and then to be told that there's nothing wrong you know yeah i mean wow. <laughs> this is fantastic you know uh safe for patients in kidney though right uh, well i mean both cat and ccta uh involve contrast so right now we have a cutoff for egfr 50 um mm. You know, so, but both, both strategies, you're going to need to give contract. And yep. I think, I think the CCTA not only is safer, I just don't like the idea of someone putting a catheter into the arterial system and then scrape the endothelium of the left main in order to look at the coronary tree. 
I just think that that is a bad thing in this day and age when we have a non-invasive way of looking at it. Who knows if you disrupt the endothelium of left main, you may get coronary disease down the line. So I, I think that when you have a non-invasive way of doing it, why do it invasively? This, this, this doesn't make any sense. And now the guideline agree with me, right? So you should do CCTA first. Good. Thank you. Thank you, George. You'll have to give nitro before uh, uh, before the injection. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a good point because in the cath lab, before you give a patient a diagnosis of coronary disease, you have to inject some nitroglycerin down the coronary to make sure that it's not vasospasm, right? So CCTA is gonna try to do the same. So every patient will give nitro to, to eliminate the possibility of coronary vasospasm so that you, you don't come back and say, hey, how do you know it's not vasospasm? Well, I gave nitro just like what they do in the cath lab. <laughs> so yes, we do nitro. And that's why you have to ask the question before you do the CCTA, if the patient had taken Viagra or Cialis, you know, so because nitro and phosphodiesterase inhibitor don't mix. <laughs> so, so these are the typical questions that we screen our patients before we do. Yeah. How many days is your, they need to stop the uh, Viagra or Cialis before you do the yeah. thing? So, yeah, for Viagra, the half-life is shorter. So 24 hours should be enough. Cialis, the half-life longer, so you need three, you know, three to four days. You got to make sure they could fit into the machine after they take the pills too. So it's got to be totally out of the system. Any other questions? Bonnie, Harris, Kelly, iPhone, Alina, Cat. They're gonna they're gonna send me a lot of email afterward. <laughs> All right, rest of those fingers. All right, guys. Fantastic talk, Mike. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, only only two, 25 people attend. Uh, just send out the video to to everybody if they want to. Uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll again. Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll uh, send out the uh, YouTube. Yeah, Thank you. All on Thank the you. Excelsior YouTube channel. All right, folks, have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.